Hello and welcome to the IdeaCast interview series episode number 58. And my guest in this episode is Dr. Mark Vernon. And uh, Dr. Vernon is a psychotherapist and writer interested in spirituality and inner life. Uh, he has a PhD in ancient philosophy as well as degrees in physics and theology. And in this episode, we discuss his book called Spiritual Intelligence in Seven Steps. And we literally go through the seven steps in this in this conversation and um, I will say in all sincerity that I very much not only enjoyed reading this book but felt uh, when I walked away <clears throat> from the completion of the book that I felt um, that it, it 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 shored up some things that I it was intuiting in my life uh, regarding matters of spirituality and human relationships with what we would call spiritual uh, so it was a very fulfilling book for me and if that's worth anything to you I would highly recommend this book um, if you are exploring the idea of spirituality so with that being said I invite you to um, tune in as an observer of this conversation as a participant uh, in a passive sense and thank you so much for being here especially to those who are uh, subscribed to my channel thank you I'd like to welcome Dr. Mark Vernon to the IdeaCast interview series. And in this conversation uh, with Dr. Vernon, we are going to be discussing his latest book, Spiritual Intelligence in Seven Steps. And um, I welcome the YouTube audience as well. And um, I know I'm going to enjoy this conversation with Mark, and I hope you all, uh, it bears fruit for you all as well. Um, the book itself, I've read it and um it's uh, really spoken to me as a good book should so dr vernon welcome to the idea cast interview series hey look thank you for inviting me on and engaging with these things and, and yeah. also the way that i try and do it yes yes the spirit of the idea cast series is to uh, i always my my pitch to people is i'm i'm interested in meaning making sense making and purpose creation or purpose discovery and and so you're fitting as you use the word niche <laughs> in your book this fits really well with with uh with my pursuits and my interests and i and i suspect that the subscribers who come and and watch the videos um are of the same mind so uh before we begin in, get into the discussion of uh spiritual intelligence and seven steps i would like to just connect with you personally and find um uh sort of a, a biographical connection uh in your life history um that not necessarily wrote, led you to write this book, but just the, the spirit quest in, in general. Well, I, I guess I've always been interested in inner life and that's taken two or three different manifestations or incarnations. Um, and I'm at work as a psychotherapist now, um, but I've um, written about people like Plato and Dante, who too are very interested in inner life. Um, I used to be a priest in the Church of England Mm. Um, and actually part of the reason why that didn't quite work out is that strangely, um, the church that I was in anyway, just wasn't very interested in inner life, mm. um, interested in lots of other good things, but not really in that. Um, but yeah, th th that's been a kind of, uh, a, a common linking theme, I guess that I can see now. And so, you know, writing these books now is, um, directly to engage with that, which has always been of interest. Okay. And to the audience, um, and I will have all relevant links uh, to Dr. Vernon's work down below, uh, including his YouTube channel, which I would highly recommend because he's been very uh, good and meticulous about um, outlining the, the seven steps uh, that we're going to be discussing uh, in this conversation. But a lot of content on his YouTube channel is worth checking out, in my humble opinion. Also, I will uh, have a link available to uh, give you access to the other books uh, that Mark has written. So uh, make, you will you will find all that down below. Um, so yes, let's open up spiritual intelligence in seven steps because we can cover a lot of ground and, and we've got about an hour to do it. So I want to firstly, I guess the intuitive question um, is to ask you, what is spiritual intelligence? And um, I, in, you, in reading your book, you can use um, a comparison of what is very popular and, and, and uh, pop phi and pop uh, psi and so forth is the uh, spirit, the emotional intelligence. And uh, so we could, if for the audience, they can start with that. And then I'll have you uh, explain what spiritual intelligence is. Yeah, emotional intelligence is essentially the ability to, 
not just have emotional experience, of course, which everybody does, but to know what to make of it, how skillfully to navigate it, um, to understand it both in yourself and others. Um, and different writers have listed different facets of that. Um, but the idea that there's different kinds of intelligence more broadly, rational intelligence, I mean, artificial intelligence now, emotional intelligence, um, the kind of know-how mm. in different domains of, of life. Um, that's a fairly familiar idea. And so actually partly because I am involved in a project um, with regular academics, both computer scientists, as well as philosophers and theologians and others, asking what spiritual intelligence might be, particularly as it differs from artificial intelligence. Mm. Um, that's how the book really most particularly came about. Um, I'm involved in the project and part of my task in the project is to try and reach out with ideas um, to a wider audience. Um, now, that said, um, these the people that look at things like emotional intelligence and other kinds of intelligence in a cognitive science discipline particularly, generally they tend to conclude that spiritual intelligence is not something distinctive. Mm. that it's part of emotional intelligence it's maybe the kind of purpose or the meaning making facet of emotional intelligence um i think that there is such a thing as spiritual intelligence but part of the reason why it struggles in the cognitive science domain is that it's not actually a kind of know that mm -hmm. so it's hard to operationalize and therefore assess in some sort of behavioral way um, rather, it's a um, sorry, it's not a know how, I should say. It's not a know okay. how, okay. it's a know that. It's right. something more right. basic. Okay. It's kind of prior to know how. And um, so, therefore, that you know, it, it's hard to, to study in an empirical science kind of way. And yet, um, it feels to me, and you know, others um, concur with this, that it's, it, it, it's a basic quality um, that, uh, that we all have but that we can become more familiar with, more aligned with, um, and it can more consciously ground our lives in it. Okay. And um, for clarity's sake, uh, I'm intuiting that the definition of spirit itself is sort of uh, looking back to the very uh, etymological, the Greek uh, reference uh, to breath or to sort of the, not the etheric, but, but the the exchange, the uh, the relationality of um, what may be abstract. Like, could could you could you nail that mm. down a little bit better? Yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a tricky word, um, <laughs> and one can spend a whole book trying to describe, define it. Of course, I mean in a way I keep try and keep it quite simple and just say, look, this is the kind of intelligence that deals with intangible things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if there's a kind of material intelligence that someone might have, if they're a very good craftsperson, um, and we know the material world. Um, refers to that which is graspable by the natural sciences, so the empirical senses. Um, yeah. But clearly, there's a whole lot more besides just the purely material world. Um, and in philosophy, morality deals with that, aesthetics deals with that, metaphysics deals with that. Um, and matters of spirit are generally to do with the more metaphysical element. Okay. Um, and um, you know, it's a useful word because whilst people can debate a lot what it means, um, people also generally know what you're talking about. Sure. Um, and so I should sort of use it in the looser sense. And the other thing is that the book, in a way, with these seven steps, is supposed to be trying to show yeah. what difference it makes in these seven domains. And if you can see what difference it makes in these seven domains, then an upfront definition matters less, really. Um, right. it's a, it's a showing rather than a telling. Okay. Okay. I, I think my, uh, my impetus for asking the question was so that the audience coming in, if somebody's not familiar with your work or familiar with a, a sort of a broader sense of what the spirit, what spirit is, or the relation of spirit to person, um, that that be just sort of set forth. But yeah, I agree. Um, we come to the conclusion at the end of your book, um, the various steps that you take, and as you said in, at the end of chapter six, that moving into chapter seven, when you talk about Kairos, that there is this um, sort of gathering of the 
five or six previous uh, uh, points made to to bring us to a to a, what I consider a very nice conclusion. Um, and so for me, in a folksy, intuitive way, I like the idea of spirit as being uh, the psyche unbound. It is the imaginal. It is the um, ability to um, beyond metacognize, just to be able to imagine and to predict things that aren't easily concretizable or you know however that works mm. you know just, just but in like, a way it's, it's it's also the very you know it's the awareness of awareness it's yeah. the it's the sense of being alive um it's yeah. it's it's not the contents it's it's the fact that yeah um and uh and being able to rest um in many spiritual traditions being able to rest in that pure awareness as well as to have the experiences and so on is a, is a key um, well, capacity, but also gift, um, and so it, it's connecting to spirit in that sense, I guess. Yes, yes. I mean, the other thing is to say, I suppose, is that you know, if someone thinks spiritual matters are a load of rot, um, then no matter how, no matter how many definitions you come up with, they're still going to think that. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, whereas someone who is <laughs> kind of sensing there's something in this, um, they're not they're 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 not going to mind too much. I hope mm -hmm. um, that the word up front is an invitation rather than um, a nailing down. Yeah, yeah. And and yes, there are hard-headed persons out there who, <laughs> who who see the mechanistic sort of robo flesh things that we are. Yeah. So we and and I suspect most of the people who come here will will um, grant us that latitude uh, and and see things through that lens. Um, and so this um, let's begin with the first step and you do a wonderful job talking about anthropogeny and the arrival on the scene of a metacognitive ape, a, a, an ape that can, can think and conceptualize beyond instinctual behavior. So let's explore that for a moment as a step two, building up uh, through your seven steps. Yeah, well, this was um, another project that I was involved with, which was looking at human origins, um, led by Robin Dunbar, an Oxford professor of paleoanthropology. Mm -hmm. And um, he is onto the traditions which do go back, but have been rather marginalized in modern times, suggesting that what is distinctive about Homo sapiens is a, a, a growth in inner freedom when it comes to dealing with immaterial things, approaching, understanding, relating to the immaterial facets of life. I mean, part of it is just knowing that there's other people around you that have an inner life, um, but more broadly in the environment, the world around too. And whilst this, uh, you know, arose out of our relationship to Homo um, heidelbergensis, say, and, and then also our cousins, Homo Neanderthals, Homo sapiens about 200,000 years ago, maybe a bit more, um, seemed to develop greater flexibility, agility in relation to inner life. Um, not just actually through metacognition, um, but but through things like ritual, through dance, through these kind of collective activities. Um, and ritual actually is really important because um, ritual is a way of trying to hold in some kind of whole the huge variety of approaches that this developed um, and also, you know, beliefs and convictions, the more cognitive side as well. Um, yeah, but I was really keen that the big story that we tell about ourselves really shapes what we make of matters of spirit. And a lot of the very popular, successful big histories, such as written by Noah Yobel Harari, they discount matters of spirit. They put it down to a useful fiction that helps us socially, you know, bonds us or something like that, but don't take it seriously. Um, so if you don't take it seriously, then you're not very likely to take spiritual intelligence seriously. But it seems to me that there's very good science, actually, that's arguing that we're homo spiritualis quite as much as we're homo sapiens. This is at the inception of our species and then develops in all sorts of ways. Um, and so being able to tell a coherent big story feels like an important first step to taking spiritual intelligence seriously. Do you think it was curious, and this is coming a little bit uh perpendicular to what you were just saying in in our development as homo sapiens um do you think the the waves of diaspora and immigration out of africa were driven by curiosity and um 
the sense of of wonder, perhaps, because we talk about migrating herds of animals that are just going for food. And that's typically the first line of discussion you hear about what moved us into the Middle East and then in through um, uh, Eurasia and, and, and perhaps into Europe. But do you think it was also a sense of wonder of what's beyond that hill or what's beyond the horizon that might have drawn us out um, the three the homo sapiens and and that, that which would become neanderthal and so forth yeah i mean i think that inner perceptions inner interest um is the driving force in homo sapiens um now it then has byproducts like it might lead to new food sources or greater expansion as populations increase um but i think that there's a very good case that can be made that um a sense that, for example, there's vast expanses of inner life that can be explored, maybe even infinite expanses of inner life that can be explored, then has the knock on effect of, well, why don't we go and explore the world around us? Mm. Um, so it becomes an exploration for its own sake rather than driven by need or necessity. Mm -hmm. That, I think, is a distinctive feature, certainly of Homo sapiens. Maybe it was part of Homo Neanderthals as well, but um, certainly of Homo sapiens. Um, you know, we're, we're not actually driven primarily by the need to survive, yeah. um, but we're actually driven by the wanting to thrive. Yeah. That's a key difference that considering ourselves spiritual creatures makes. Um, and, you know, part of why the reason you can say this is that earlier species of homos seems to have been, to have been very successful purely in terms of survival. Um, but for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, um, didn't really change that much in terms of um, the artifacts they've left behind. So Heidelbergensis, for example, you know, were making the same stone axes for, I think, you know, even 800,000 years, mm. um, not really developing very much. They didn't need to um, purely in terms of survival. But then Homo sapiens, of course, change comparatively very rapidly. Um, and so what's driving that? It's not the need for pure survival. It's It's an inner drive um, and so it's that that kind of reason which you can put together um, to suggest that something different not unique not completely distinctive but nonetheless something really took off um, with homo sapiens that that's led us to be the creatures we are now okay and i would suspect that also given the social nature of all three uh heidelbergensis neanderthal and sapiens um I, we perhaps had a little more cognitive hardware on board or something uh but the social nature that that is kind of a a means of drawing out um rather than just simple grunts or simple cues uh that that this develops too i think along maybe along that timeline and that helps to nurture the wonder and the curiosity and the uh art the future proto art that's being made and, and things like that would that make sense that our social nature kind of helped us move in a uh I don't want to say evolutionary, but a but a growth uh, movement forward. Yeah, this um, is also to bring in another facet, which is in evolutionary science, but is relatively marginal. Um, the idea that there can be top down um, causation or mm -hmm. more draws, perhaps more pulls in evolution, as well as just sort of bottom up random mutation. And this is you mentioned niche already. This is associated with niche theory. OK. Um, now, look, a lot of um, evolutionary scientists consider niche theory. Um, that's in it, not in itself marginal, but there's particularly one Cambridge professor of um, evolutionary biology, Simon Conway Morris, in the field, very, very well known. But he argues that niches aren't just made by creatures as they evolve, but actually discovered by creatures and explored by creatures. And that whereas uh, many creatures discover and explore material niches you know like fish water birds air we human beings discover immaterial niches mm. like um, that which is good beautiful and true and that drives our desire um, and our evolution um, and it comes about through changes in the brain um, in part you know there is a sort of certain basic um, faculty that's needed but the exploration far exceeds um, the basic faculty you know so for example you know, we don't just make functional objects, we make very, very beautiful objects. Um, and there's something about the beauty that becomes more valuable than the function. So those kind of immaterial niches, like the niche of beauty, um, is something that we in part 
discover, but then explore and even perhaps develop. Let's move Homo sapiens along a little bit in your book. And um, one thing I found that was, let's talk about freedom first. And then I want to um, talk about, there was the, the axial shift where we go from a, narr um, uh, a, a sort of egalitarian communal uh, psyche collective perhaps, or, or individual, which is the point of that topic. But let's talk about freedom ahead of that, I guess, and then move into that aspect of your book. And, and freedom, again, we have the libertarian sense in the modern era, but you're talking about a different kind of freedom. And I, I, I found that interesting. Yeah, no. So this is my sort of second step, if you like, that once yeah. you've got a good story in place, then um, how do you respond to that story, you might say? And this is part of the freedom which we have. Um, and though it is an older notion of freedom that I think is really important now because it's got lost, um, it's not, as you say, the libertarian notion as if the will can be free when it can just have whatever it wants. Um, rather, um, our freedom is not just from constraints, but is for something. Um, again, a fairly familiar distinction that philosophers make. Um, but then with the extra twist that spiritual intelligence brings which is that it's a freedom to align with that which is greater than the self um, and the reason why that's a form of freedom is because that which is greater than the self is the space into which we're um, moving anyway um, and so this is the freedom associated with a lot of spiritual traditions um, and it's why seemingly paradoxical statements arise so for example in the christian tradition it's sometimes said that service is greatest freedom and mm. um, but the point is that this is the, in the service of that which is beautiful and true the divine um and so when you align your life with that which is the source of life um, and is the fullest manifestation actualization of life then you find the greatest freedom in your life as well um so the seeming paradox actually is yeah. um is is the, is the path to follow I think the the paradox will fall apart when you do understand the depth of what's being provided there, that if you enter into service, you render yourself free. Yeah. And again, we have yeah. modern, we have modern, uh, perhaps misconceptions, again, what these terms mean. Uh, so it's interesting, you have to sort of carefully follow that. But yeah, it does seem like a cone at first that you're, you're bound up uh, and, and obligated to and then but the freedom that comes from that. And, and I think that's really nice. That almost has a Taoist sense where you can find that flow uh, for what can express through you uh, as work for the good or, or to a, a sort of higher and um, that, yeah, you find tremendous, uh, and that's expressed, you mentioned um, uh, pivotal people, inspirational people who, who share those, uh, those um, uh, glimpses into that uh, almost indescribable <laughs> sensation of, of what it means uh, to, to reap that product of, of service. Um, mm -hmm. So, so I, allude, I mentioned a moment ago, we, you reference as we moved into the common era, and we're moving fast forward pretty quickly. Uh, was there anything we want to check in with before we get to the to that axial period um, relating to growth and relating to homo spiritualis um, sort of developing itself and in, in, in how, how your book progresses did i leave anything out or can we move into that next phase well uh, in a way the maybe just something to mention is that i'm deeply influenced by those thinkers who have argued that our consciousness shifts significantly over time and okay. um, that the way that our earlier ancestors before say 3000 years ago experienced themselves was quite different from how we experience ourselves and roughly speaking you could say that there's i think very good evidence that earlier peoples experienced themselves from the outside in and so um the business of being a person was very much how you relate to that which is outside um, and so you know a lot of early ritual um, is associated with relating to the presences, the spirits, the gods um, that are um, around and about and having um, a, a good relationship with them is very much um, the way that you have a good life as an individual. Um, but now I think that we are much more inclined, first of all, to think of life as being from the inside out. Um, and so, you know, it's why we, we think a lot about inner life. Um, and so you have to account for that shift. And this is one way of calling it is to call it the axial shift, um, when 
it's quite a complicated story, quite an interesting story in its own right. But roughly speaking, these figures pop up in different civilizations, China, India, around the Mediterranean, and with, with increasing research actually now um, in Africa, and um, I guess even in the Americas. And these figures seem to constellate a new way of relating to yourself, which is to ask yourself about yourself. So Socrates' famous motto is know thyself. Mm -hmm. um, and he goes around asking questions which call into question the old wisdom, but also then make space for a new way of grounding wisdom. Um, and this is um, leads to the birth of the, the sense of being an individual from the inside out. And you can track it in art, you can track it in theology, um, you can track it in the development of things like democracy and so on. Um, the, the individual is no longer just part of a whole, but has some relationship to the whole in their own right. And in conjunction with that, um, I think in, in your book, you were describing how there was this shift um, from that sort of collective egalitarian society to um, the emergence of players that were um, sort of de deified kings and, and they played this role uh, both, I guess, as transcendent, you know, uh, born, but transcendent. And, and, and that was a shift in our perspective um, from a group, from an identity that emanates out and then the identity um, that we are part of a bigger whole. Um, so can you explain some of that? Mm. Because that's important, I think, in your book about um, how, as we evolved and moved up culturally, mimetically, socially, that um, this this period, this chapter happened that helped yeah. kind of bring us to where we are now. I yeah, think. so, I mean, you have to ask, you know, how did this sense of being an individual even get going? Um, so, I mean, you know, we quite naturally use a phrase like you did, collective egalitarianism. Um, but that actually is a modern way of putting it because the word egalitarian assumes that the individual might not live in, a, in an egalitarian society. Mm. Um, whereas I think before um, it was pure collectivism. Okay. Um, there wasn't even the sense of an individual to, to, to desire their equality. And your sense of yourself very much came from where you were in the collective. Um, but what happened, I think, is that um, as perhaps as populations grew, um, how to manage that collective became a problem. And this is work done particularly by figures like Robert Bella, the sociologist who wrote a wonderful book called Religion in Human Evolution. And he charts how um, individuals that um, symbolize the whole of the collective um, arose. Um, you know, Kings is the obvious example of that. Um, but then what happens is that if there's an individual symbolizing the whole, the idea that there can be an individual starts to dawn in people's minds okay. um, and kings and pharaohs and other kinds of leaders um, tend to be unstable um, because um, the collective sees its security in this figure and of course security isn't always deliverable um, so kings and pharaohs and others tend to get um, overthrown and but what that does leave though is the sense of the possibility of being an individual which then gets as we're taken back into the members of the collective who start to conceive of themselves as individuals and in particular with the possibility of having a relationship to the divine mm. which divine kings and pharaohs tended to hold for the collective as well um and you know so for example in the hebrew bible it's why there's this huge tension between the priests and the kings on the one hand and the prophets on the other and the prophets arise saying, no, individuals should have a relationship to Yahweh, um, not through the mediation of the king. And anyway, the upshot is that um, in the notion even of being an individual gets born um, and in time becomes the dominant way of sensing what it is to be an individual. Around the time of the, the birth of the common era, I think okay. it's one of the significant um, deep reasons why we tend to think of the turn of the millennia from before the common era into the common era somehow carrying significance 
Um, it's because I think it's by then that the sense of individuality has really bedded down. And <clears throat> from a culturally evolutionary perspective, I think I, I was listening to you and I was almost intuiting that having the pars pro toto as uh, something you can live vicariously through or experience um, the divine through them, um, it seems to make it more efficient as we're settling into agriculture, settling into things like house home building and, and collecting uh, a more uh, sedentary lifestyle, uh, that that seems like that might fit well to uh, not necessarily convenience, but for practicality, maybe because um, things shift roles are shifting and things are emerging, not just necessarily trade and exchange, but just the roles that you play in a day to day versus say before the um, younger Dryas period or pottery or whatever, you know, <laughs> where we were more uh, uh, migrational and, and having to depend on where herds went or things like that. Does that make sense that we, we can then, it, it's kind of like we um, outsource now uh, was a common term. Is that, a, is that a type of outsourcing or is it more, in line with uh, this just coalesced and and it made sense that this king, this person, this out, you know, the uh, extrovert type person came along and 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 uh, set that relationship up. Yeah, I mean, it, the you can every time you sort of return to the story, you can make it more complicated. And OK, okay. I mean, one, one way of responding to um, what you're just saying there actually is that um, after I finished writing the book, um, another book came out called The Dawn of Everything by David Graeber and David Wengro. Okay. Who, um, David Wengro is an archaeologist um, and David Graeber was uh, a sort of genius philosopher, really. Mm. I know, but they make a very good case that the architect archaeology now shows that um, the, there aren't really phases, you know, moving from hunter gatherer into agriculture, oh, into yeah. city building and so on. Um, and um, they argue that there's a kind of anarchic um, series of experiments um, all over the world and they shift and move, you know, um, with quite a lot of freedom. And what they don't answer, though, and, and when I read um, their book, um, this came to my mind, is that um, what might be driving these different experiments in organised living is partly practical matters, of course, um, but is, again, this inner freedom that homo sapiens have to try different things out and ask wow. how satisfying are they? Um, okay. You know, how much do they um, bring meaning and purpose to life as much as the practical necessities of living? And so I think that perhaps in the future, someone will write the story where these two things come together, actually, that inner life coupled to the archaeological evidence um, puts to one side this rather linear sense of, the development of Homo sapiens, which again dominates in books like uh, Noah Yoval Harari's, um, and realizes that we have a lot of inner freedom um, to organize ourselves, not out of pure volition, mm -hmm. but out of following that which is purposeful, meaningful, good, beautiful, and true in life. And that actually is what shapes um, society. It's prior to society, you might say. You know, the old story is that. And notions of the divine come in order to service society to keep it ordered in some way but this is to flip it around and say no organizations of society come in order to explore the divine perception i'll opt for the <laughs> for option b myself yeah absolutely now in uh, step three you talk about um seeing reality as simple if i'm saying that correctly and so can you unpack that for us and, and maybe that ties into some of the steps we've just taken. I don't know. Yeah, so this is um, what I think follows from the notion of freedom, freedom to align with that, which is good, beautiful and true, um, because strangely, the greatest freedom comes with the simplest perception of reality. Now, this isn't simple as in basic or sort of perfunctory. Um, this is simple as in the one thing that can do many, many, many things. OK. Um, uh, an example that sometimes given is that um, if you have a knife, a very rather simple tool, which of course our ancestor had, and part of the appeal of such a simple tool is that you can do many, many things with it. Um, and so again, I wonder whether the notion of that kind of practical simplicity arises from an inner sense that that which is most simple inwardly 
is that which can give rise to the manifold facets of existence. Um, and in developed theology, it's why God um, is called the most simple thing that is. Mm. Um, it's not that God is somehow, um, or the notion of God is simplistic, um, but if there is to be a, a unity, a oneness um, that contains all things, it must also be um, completely simple in order that the variety of things therefore can arise out of it. That's what I find attractive about apophasis and negative spirituality is it is this peeling away <clears throat> of what would be our contrivance and uh, and just being present with uh, that simplicity. And mm -hmm. uh, and then the relatability, I think, uh, um, affords itself to us or or, or uh, reveals itself perhaps to us. Yeah, no. And, and generally, you know, it's not a um, just a theological notion, even in science, you know, mm -hmm. the simplest theory that can explain many things right. is more likely to be the one you go for. So sure. it's that same kind of, of prin principle that's at play here. Makes perfect sense. So um, settling the soul is step number four. And um, that's a heavy one. <laughs> settling the soul. Can we can we look at that one for a moment? Yeah, well, thank you for pushing on. Um, well, yeah, because I, I know my time with you is limited. So, I, and and I yeah, and, no, no, and but, seven is like you know I could spend an hour on seven alone. So, but I but know. anyway, settling the soul. I want to yeah. make sure we get so, everybody included. If if you know you buy step three that um, reality is simple, then how do you align with that simplicity? And so in this settling the soul step, um, really what I wanted to tackle was it feels to me like a lot of spiritual practice be that in institutional religious forms or in more new age forms or in therapeutic forms. Um, it's very good at um, addressing the ups and downs of our personal inner life, mm -hmm. um, which you might call the soul. If soul just means kind of our vitality that we most directly experience, um, then that, that was what Aristotle thought of as the soul, for example. Um, you can, you need to do some, sort of work on that um, in order that it doesn't just push you around and, and throw you off balance all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but there comes a point where enough of that's done where so the soul is settled enough, not perfectly, but enough in order that a deeper sense of life might start to come through. And okay. again, the terms are used in different ways, but for the sake of using a term, I, I call this spirit, if you like, the kind of the ground or the wellspring of the more immediate vitality that we experience more directly as our own. And so step four is about how, when the soul is settled enough, this wider spirit starts to become more consciously known as well. And so it's an important full step for spiritual intelligence. That could be a rather voluminous and, and, and deep step in the 21st century um, since we've, uh, gone from being uh, a, a mechanical uh, civilization to now a technical civilization. We were technical prior, technically, but more uh, technical now to sort through uh, what we've created for ourselves, um, which I would just say is, um, you know, use the static uh, signal kind of analogy that um, there's so much static out there and there is good signal coming from all of this development. And I, ref I refer may probably to the uh, to the internet and all the amazing amount of good information that's out there but also the distraction that goes with it too um so settling the soul in the 21st century uh is it, to me is is uh a task that must be entered into with uh, reverence but at the same time um I don't think it's an impossible task, I think. Uh, and that's why I said to you before we hit record, you are among a stable of about seven or eight people that I find working in very good faith to try to bring some uh, expediency, not in the physical or not in a literal sense, but just bringing things to the fore so that people have a means to ground themselves in um, sense, meaning, purpose, that kind of thing. So so settling the soul in the 21st century, is that, uh, does that, I just made it sound very dramatic, but is that something that you would say is is an undertaking vis-a-vis -vis maybe the 19th century when we were agricultural and somewhat industrial, but not to the level where we are now? Yeah, I suppose it, it, one way of responding to what you're saying, which I'm sure is, is, is right and necessary, um, is sometimes, you know, people, drawn a bit of T.S. Eliot, who famously makes this distinction between um, data, knowledge, 
um, intelligence and wisdom, say. Mm. And um, I don't think he does it quite like that, but you take the point. And so, you know, we now uh, have huge amounts of accumulating data, um, you know, so much so that um, it's got to the point where you, it's very hard to know quite what to do with it all. Um, you know, artificial, inte artificial intelligence now um, in a recent iteration, for example, um, might well have a kind of randomized function within it where it only looks at, say, one in every 10 bits of data because there's so much data around mm. in order to try to, to discern patterns within it. Um, but what we have consciously um, is the capacity to, from data, to develop knowledge and then to develop wisdom. And again, <clears throat> that kind of directionality um, that you can orientate yourself to through the welter of stuff um, mm -hmm. that is around and about um, provides a guide. It, it, it provides not just purpose, but actually a way of actually living um, and becomes, I think, increasingly a practical necessity. Yeah. Um, you know, similarly with consumption, I mean, this is something which um, a developed consumer society already knows very well. Um, how do you choose what you can buy um, if you don't just go on ever um, new options um you know sort of just variety for its own sake um is there something that's drawing you through this variety that actually is ultimately satisfying um and so that i'm sure that's another facet of, of which spiritual intelligence can help provide oh for sure for sure it's a grounding mechanism i think and uh to pull up john verveke's language i think that's what he talks about when he thinks when he speaks of relevance realization and combinatorial explosions is that the ability to frame and to zero in uh on something and then see the relevance in that in your in your intentionality or whatever it is that's going on there um is is good uh, had to throw a verveke phrase he's got so many so many one-liners it's great but anyway uh so let's get on to the really light and airy breezy subject the spirit of of learning how to die that's that's a, a, a step five in the uh, seven steps and um yeah let's talk about that uh, well i feel that any wisdom or spiritual tradition worth it salt needs to address the question of death mortality um rather than you know the modern approach which is to try to well, perhaps push it to one side, if not transcend it, go under it and remove it. <laughs> and the reason why the wisdom spiritual traditions um, focus on death and dying is not um, just because it's going to happen, we're mortal creatures, but because they perceive that actually this process of dying to oneself, um, which is, you know, the more spiritual way of putting it, actually leads to more and more life um, so mm. death becomes a process of being born again um, it becomes the way to by moving through it to enter the portal that leads to wider life and um, so I wanted to have a chapter on this um, you know which also feels really important in the 21st century because um, certainly through the COVID pandemic you know I've worked in hospitals as a psychotherapist and um it felt like we medicalized death during the covid pandemic um often for very good reason and with good results as well but if that's all you do with a threat like a pandemic you overload your medical services because of course people bring not just practical biological questions to a pandemic but existential and spiritual questions um, and if you try and medicalize that side of things um the medical services get overwhelmed Mm. And so it feels really important um, to think about death because of uh, imminent reasons as well as timeless reasons. Um, but um, the spiritual traditions teach that it's possible to die before you die, which is another way that it's sometimes put mystery traditions, rituals, um, the the myths um, that shape the great traditions, um, not least, of course, Christianity, have death at the heart of them. And so working out a way of approaching that, which um, also acknowledges the fear and anxiety um, around that seems like a really important um, part of any book on spiritual intelligence. And, and the, the tradition I particularly draw on in this step, I sort of draw on different traditions in different steps, but um, in this one is the Platonic tradition um, and particularly Plato's dialogue, the Phaedo, 
mm. which is the dialogue in which Socrates actually dies. And it seems to me that this is really crucial. You mentioned John Vivaki. John Vivaki is very alert to what's sometimes called third wave Platonism mm -hmm. now, which sees the, the drama of a platonic dialogue as absolutely fundamental to what the dialogue is trying to convey to you. And so I look at that in this step of thinking about death. Even in your telling of the of the Phaedra in your book, I felt the tension, you know, so it was a third hand <laughs> telling of the tension. And that made it that was impactful. So I, I'm glad you um, you had that in your book. Um, and again, to the audience, uh, this book is certainly worth purchasing. And there are these moments uh, where you connect through, again, iterations of, of thinking and personal stories and anecdotes and things like that. So uh, before we get to seven, there is resonating with reality. If we could share that for a moment and then I, and the time we have left, I want to talk about time. <laughs> so. So, so, so six, six is um, to do with virtue. Okay. Um, and um, the idea and the resonating with reality idea is that, um, again, it's a kind of critique of, of the modern world where we tend to think about ethics and morality. But the trouble with ethics and morality is that it focuses on particular moments, particular decisions, particular issues, and is inclined to bifurcate them. You know, is it good or bad to do X or Y? And there's some practical use in that. You have to make decisions. Mm -hmm. But I think that culturally, um, this is dividing us now more than it's uniting us. And so ethics and morality have been weaponized in the culture wars. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's a natural consequence of losing... The older tradition again which spiritual intelligence knows about which is the virtue tradition where what is prioritized is not decision but who you are what you're becoming the character the personal habits the qualities that you are well sometimes training yourself in even the virtues and the reason why this is valuable is not just because it helps you to live a flourishing life which all the writers on virtue would tell you but also because it helps you resonate more and more with reality because um when you are good you are awakened to the good around when you can live a beautiful life you're awakened to that which is beautiful around you um, and so these qualities really matter for our, our exploration of the world as much as for living you know a more or less flourishing life um, so hence that is an important step too Absolutely. And I totally agree because, you know, when you explore the deontic, um, the directives of uh, even ethics, which, uh, you know, morality, I, I, have very, I, I get its place in the social contract, but I also understand ethics for myself to be uh, a more user friendly <laughs> means of living a, a life that um, your your interaction with others is uh, sort of uh, to use the pro-social i guess you know a good way to um or, or positive affect uh is 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 achieved um did you so, just leap in there but i mean i think again it's really important this inversion that we've touched on already that yeah. the pro-social consequences are are a byproduct they're not the driver right and i think okay. that that's part of what's got weaponized now is that um you know someone should behave well and um, because um you know they seek um altruism or they seek it instrumentalizes ethics um mm -hmm. to easily, trans transaction you know whereas whereas sort of the virtue approach would be to say that um the virtuous person actually becomes less concerned with themselves because they are more and more aware of the wider world um so it's a it's a it's a virtuous spiral um that they're on yeah it opens it's it opens them up yeah, opens them up. A, yeah. A, and a simple way of putting it yeah yeah, and and in and in my own personal life, I like the ethics of compassion or empathy. Uh, you know, I know Schopenhauer touched on that a little bit, but just the ability to relate uh, to the other <clears throat> and to have that um, that um, means to stop for a moment. And uh, I I do that with uh, and and I may preach it more than I practice it, but it's it's when I've come across somebody who's troublesome or quarrelsome or we get something goes wrong. Uh, I just try to understand what subclinic, subclinical little things might be going on, or if the, even there is a pathology there, a neurosis or something. And I think I I don't understand where they're coming from, but I have to understand what m might be going on. And that way I don't project you know, my perfection of who I am onto them. So, so that's where my compassion, I think, in, but the virtue too. And, and so virtue, uh, that can be 
taken a couple of ways. So can you can you ground virtue for us briefly and then we'll move into to the step seven? Yeah, it's it's an unfortunate word in some ways because you know the virtuous individual, certainly in you know British English is someone who is perhaps thought to be a bit of a prude right. um, and not very likable. Um but um I think that um it's the word that's in the tradition and it's a word that's worth trying to reclaim. Um, when you explain that this is about your qualities, your habits, your characteristics, um, your your inclination to respond in certain ways, your inclination to position yourself in certain ways. You know, so the virtue of humility, for example, is not self-abasement, um, but the virtue of, of humility is a kind of openness because it can say yes to whatever's happening in life. It doesn't have that sort of defensiveness or pushing away. Um, and I like what you read every so often how humility is likened to the sea and the sea is in the lowest place but that means it can receive all things that flow into it mm. um and so i hope that um uh, the virtue can start to be felt to be something desirable um not just something that some people have in a rather off-putting way yeah or it's performative perhaps <laughs> yeah well yeah virtual signal is all virtue virtual signaling True, true to two two degrees. Yes, I I would agree. And and I looked up the etymology of uh, humility the other day. I love the Latin origin of words or the Greek origin of words. And and so the the humus, you know, the the grounding and the and the soil and the earth. So when you humiliate yourself, that has a sort of negative modern. You know, you feel embarrassed or you walked out in your underwear in front of a room. It's more that you are willing to ground yourself in or lower yourself from where the egoic heights that you may have, the lofty heights of self worth and importance and bring mm -hmm. yourself down to a more uh, humble uh, position and your perspective will change and you will be mm -hmm. able to perhaps see things differently. So uh, mm -hmm. my tuppence on that. So, yeah, okay, yeah. let's get to number seven. Cause again, I, I want to not take too much of your time um, living with interruptions and it referenced it, it, your examining time. Uh, so let's talk about the two types of time that you discuss and that you, you treat in that final chapter, uh, because this this is this really got my juices flowing mentally uh, when you talk about the Kairos and the Kronos. So let's mm -hmm. let's talk about that before we uh, wrap up. Yeah. So in some ways, I think that um, if we can develop different perceptions of time and fall in love with different perceptions of time, then that can take us a long, long way. Um, both individually, but also in shared ways, collective ways, even cultural ways. Um, and it's the broad distinction which you mentioned there with these two words, chronos and kairos, and they're Greek words, chronos as in chronological. So it's the clock time, the tick, tick, ticking, measurable, quantitative use of time, um, which of course is very valuable, um, but it's tended to squeeze out um, another complementary notion of time, which is the kairos time. And this is the kind of the pregnancy of the moment, um, the revelation that might come um, in the now. And so it's treating time not just as a quantity um, to kind of get through or that might feel like it's running out, um, but as a quality that in any moment might deliver something expansive or challenging, of course. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's an, an old word. Um, sometimes it's used in ancient Greek sources uh, in relation to rhetoric. You know, so the good rhetorician has an alert to, to Kairos because mm -hmm. they know when to deliver the phrase that moves the crowd. I mean, you know, Barack Obama was a past master at Kairos when he could say, yes, we can. And the whole crowd would be moved. Oh, very good. Um, yeah. So it's an alertness to that. But also it has uh, uh, another use, which I quite like, which is in relation to weaving. Mm. And when you get into um, a rhythmic activity like weaving, you partly get into a Kairos perception because you know when to throw the shuttle through the loom. Um, and so, um, and then something is is born, is made, is created um, in that uh, Kairotic um, activity. Um, so there's a, there's nice creative, rich ways of, of trying to convey what Kairos might be like, which is a large part of what I try to do with, with step, step seven. So again, sort of show what it might be like to live with this awareness of Kairos. And so that's relating um, directly with instances of events and time. And so you could separate the two and the Kronos comes in on for the ride, but it is the instances that occur in a, in a space of time, I guess. Um, as you And I'm seeing that as a shuttle goes through the loom 
and the person is synchronized to that. And I, that's so hypnotic. I had a back in the seventies when I was a kid, we had a friend and she <laughs> could do that. And just choo, 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 choo. It's just very hypnotic. Uh, so that's being one with the Kairos. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and the two must come together. I think, you know, I mean, I mean, as, as often is the case when you're thinking about spiritual matters, music is often a really good example. And of course, music, you know, has clock time. Um, it has, you know, if you ever learned a musical instrument, you probably used a metronome at some mm -hmm. point that counted time for you. Um, okay. But the, but the chronos there is in the service of the kairos, um, which is, you know, the the meaning of the music, the climax of the music, the way that the music takes you through um, different emotions and experiences. Um, and so, you know, music that was pure chronos would be dead and flat. Um, whereas when the chronos can be put into the service of the chirotic um dynamics within the music then the music comes alive and speaks to you well my hope for this book is that it changes lives and trajectories and enriches uh people with the wisdom that is uh woven into the book and uh again uh, before we hit record i i thanked you very much because it's part of it resonated with me uh, uh very deeply uh because you reference a lot of people. This is a good reference book too. It, it you can move beyond the book to other uh, wisdom traditions and persons throughout history uh, who have uh, contributed to the ideas that you've uh, put uh, collected and, and and inserted into this book. So, again, I want to thank you with sincerity um, for your efforts and for what you've done to create this book. And to the YouTube audience, um, I am being deeply sincere when I say that this book is uh, is worth your time and uh, worth your kairos <laughs> your engagement with it um and um uh, and again all relevant information will be down below uh, dr vernon I'll, I'll ask you if you have any any thoughts that you'd like in, to impart on the audience relating either to the book or to future aspirations any any way that you want to conclude this conversation i would welcome that now hey Lou, well, just say thanks for what you just said because it's it's a wonderful thing when you write a book and it it connects <sighs> with others so i do appreciate that very much um and um also yeah th this book very much very consciously tries to draw particularly on confucian indian um arabic um as well as uh, western christian um jewish resources mm -hmm. um i wanted to to draw on perennial themes um and um you know also to say that i feel very aware that it's right, writ written in a time where there's a lot of uncertainty a lot of potential and, and actual suffering around mm. um you know so for example you know part of the um hope with this reflection on time and kairos is that it's called befriending eruptions because it feels like we're living in a time where there's going to be eruptions mm. um and if we can befriend them can see them as having chirotic potential rather than just being crises or catastrophes to try and avoid but as pivots for our transformation individually and collectively um, you know, then that's going to have a sort of extra practical benefit for now. I think that's a wonderful way to leave it. I um, I watched a documentary the other day uh, on uh, Native Americans, and and somebody asked somebody a question who was who was an indigenous person, and and it, they referenced time, and they were like. We don't really do time. <laughs> they, they, they haven't. And, and this was referenced in your book where there was a, uh, a missionary who went to a, a, a New World uh, tribe in South America and uh, they were seeing something and interacting with it. And, and the Howley was just <laughs> at a loss for what they were doing. I mean, he understood what was going on, uh, you know, conceptually, but just not getting the phenomenology out of it. And and so I I, I when we were talking at some point, I remember this mini documentary. Uh, this gentleman went around to all the different uh, uh, reservations in the United States and was talking to different uh, tribes. And one person just kind of jokingly said, you know, time. <laughs> it's not it's not the way you guys do it. So. I love that 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 grounding that that richness. I went through a tangent last year watching um, tribal cultures uh, throughout the world, whether it's Micronesia or Africa or even in the Amazon, and just their organizational um, uh, methods and means to keep their extended families or tribes to to function. Um, it's just fascinating. It's just such a beautiful insight to go back thirty thousand years and see what we were doing and then to reflect on where we are now. And uh, um, I know anarcho-primitivism is a, is a, 
is a critique, uh, but I love the idea that you can draw the best out of the past and, and in integrate it into the future and not necessarily take anarcho-primitivism seriously, but just use it as a method of critique. Uh, and so um, some of the values that were coming from your book uh, and some of the uh, and the, the uh, intentions you had to, to reach out to people um, are, are not necessarily a critique, but they're a good observation to, uh, to just take a pause and, and think of where we are at this point in our history and or, or yeah, no, they, they, creation. They, 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 they spark the imagination because um, I certainly don't believe that there's any going back. No, um, I think no. there, are, there are things of great value and um, which are actually central to our sense of ourselves um, that we need. Um, but we also need to sort of go forward. Yeah. And um, if something can spark your imagination um, and show you that things can be different, then that is of immense value um, and can help spur the response to the future and draw us forward. Absolutely. Well, I look forward to more creation, more content creation. If you do on your YouTube channel, you also interview people and you bring in some really interesting guests, people who have good things to say. And I'm looking forward to more of that. Um, Perhaps you'll write another book and of course, no pressure, of course, but uh, if that happens, I will look forward to that as well. And again, I may dig, dig through your archives and pull out a book. And uh, perhaps if you enjoyed this interview, we can have you back at some point, um, either later this year or next year, and we can have another discussion because I, I thoroughly enjoyed speaking with you. I've learned a lot, um, not only through this book, but again, I, as I mentioned before, we started the conversation on record that uh, I've been following you for a couple of years and I, I just, I value your work. So I want to acknowledge that, uh, offer my gratitude to you for that uh, because you're helping me and I'm going to go out and talk to people and try to create my impression in my own little way that I can do that uh, and this show does that and and uh, what I love about these YouTube conversations is they gain lives of their own so the, the the videos go out into the world and they uh, they run into people and and change ideas and thoughts or or just shift things so anyway I want to thank you very much for coming on and having a conversation with me very yeah, look, well, thank you. I appreciate what you say and it, it is very much a, a dialogue. Um, even when you're writing a book um, on your own, it, it arises out of conversation, discussion. And then, of course, when the book appears, to have a dialogue about it. Um, and you find yourself saying things that you didn't quite know you were going to say and as people respond. So it's all part of it. I do appreciate um, what you're doing and, and being part of what you're doing as well. I like to think of myself as that second tier uh below my heroes guys that are doing and, and i say hero not to load anybody's ego up but just you know you and mcgillchrist and sheldrake and vernon uh you're vernon and uh verveke that's where i was trying to go so people like a castrop i just had bernardo on last week so guys that really inspire me i i try to in good faith you know bring them on for conversations and then if i run into somebody on the street or a friend or whatever i try to convey and say hey listen go read this person's book or or do that and i think that's you know it's kind of the indra's net of of social um dispersal and mimetic dispersal i love that term of just other than the silliness of the meme on the internet the, the mimetic dispersal that we have uh available to us and and uh, the flow that comes from that so i i thank you again and to the youtube audience i i thank you all very much uh for listening to dr vernon and myself have this conversation and in this dialogue and um uh perhaps he'll be back and so we can all look forward to that but i do again thank you all so very much and again any uh relevant information for dr vernon's work will be found down below in the description field and mark i will say goodbye to you after we're done uh, after i hit the uh, pause on the record but to the youtube audience thank you again and uh, you all be well so all right let me hit the stop here